Today's episode of the Bill Simmons Podcast on the Ringer Podcast Network is brought to you by SeatGeek, our presenting sponsor. Buy and sell tickets, two taps on your phone, everything fully guaranteed. Football fans, $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase on NFL tickets. Use promo code BSNFL. Download the SeatGeek app or go right to SeatGeek.com. We're also brought to you by Hotel Tonight, an app that helps you find amazing hotel deals at the last minute, up to seven days in advance, perfect for a spontaneous getaway or indulging in a little staycation. Booking on Hotel Tonight gives you the freedom and flexibility to play things by ear while knowing you'll score a great price and a great place to stay. We almost need an NBA trades tonight because that's how fast these trades are going. Spontaneous trades. Uh, get in on these killer last minute deals. Download the Hotel Tonight app right now. <laughs> All right, Graham Carter, in in the office studio. Been waiting to do this for a long time. You're a busy man. Uh, not 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 anymore. <laughs> yeah. When do you stop being busy? Um, well, I you know I'm retiring. No, I'm not retiring. I'm stepping down from Vanity Fair, in the, at the end of the year. And um, yeah, after 25 years there, it seems about time. I was still shocked. Why? I don't know. I just, it's, yeah. it was like a Lorne Michaels thing. It's, yeah. Yeah. You, we, you we Canadians just, hold our jobs <laughs> a long time. <laughs> you assume at some point it's going to happen, but you don't yeah. know it's actually going to happen. And it's like, yeah, great. It's stepping down. It's like, what? No, I thought, you know, um, I haven't had a break in 39 years. So um, we're moving to Provence for six months. We've rented a house, put our youngest uh, daughter in school there. And, some time to think and I'm on a listing tour until the end of the year trying to figure out what I'm going to do. I have a million ideas. I've just got to winnow them down. So you've had one of my favorite careers. Oh, thanks. We've talked, we've talked, we've never done a podcast, but we've talked. I've never done a podcast. You've never done a podcast. My first, this will be a, collector, oh, wow. it'll be a collector's I'll, item. I'll be, gen yeah. I'll be gentle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I've told you this, but I'm going to say it again for the listeners. So you, you create Spy Magazine in the mid eighties with Kurt Anderson, right. which um, is one of my five favorite magazines of all time and came at a point. Wait, what are the other four? Inside Sports, okay. uh, Sports Illustrated. Yeah. Early, not recent Sports okay, Illustrated. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Rolling Stone. Right. And- uh, That's enough, that's good company. Probably Vanity Fair. There, wow. Because uh, I just, I always look at it from the standpoint of I never really want to subscribe to magazines. I don't like getting them in the mail. Even when I was a kid, unless it was something I loved, it's just clutter and then you feel obligated to read it. Right. And they're hit a point with magazines. You build a business on that. Yeah. I know. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're hit a point with magazines where I just didn't want to get them anymore. And the only ones I really look forward to were Sports Illustrated until the early 2000s, and Vanity Fair, and New York Magazine's another one that I, that That's I do. That's great. Like. But, yeah, okay. but at Vanity Fair, I was always like, I know there's going to be two things that I love, that I'm going to really enjoy. I know, I know I'm going to get 15 to 30 really good minutes out of this magazine, which yeah. I think is how all magazines, Premier Magazine used to be like that for me in yeah, the it 90s. It was really good, yeah. Entertainment Weekly was like that for a while. Right. For me, where it's like, I'm getting this magazine, Us Weekly, in the mid-2000s. <laughs> okay. I'm going to get 20 yeah. minutes out yeah. of it. Like you almost don't know in your head That's how many minutes That's almost before the Kardashians, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's the, the Instagram and social media really yeah. Us Weekly. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. celebrities became too available. Exactly. So anyway, Spy... Which um, sometimes what happens with these things is after they kind of have peaked or they've gone away, then everybody exalts it. And it be, there's this mythology that they, yeah. it definitely happened with Grantland. I was like, where were these people the first two years? <laughs> where were all of you <laughs> as we were getting shit on? Um, but with Spy, it was like in the moment, people were like, holy shit. Yeah, this is, this yeah. is, and I think one of the things, that really stands out just thinking back why it worked what were the things that made it kind of people go holy shit was celebrities just were not self-aware yet and you guys flipped that's a good it. point yeah you know what i mean yeah. the 70s 80s it was celebrities just behaving poorly but nobody calling them out well, we on it we sort of redefine what is in new york what a celebrity was i mean we went after you know wrote about the editor of the new york times and the wife of the editor of the new right. york times and socialites on fifth avenue and, trump and and a lot of donald trump yeah 
And you were the anti-establishment yes, for fact, a long time. Yes, in fact, we spent five years making fun of Vanity Fair. So coming to Vanity Fair was, um, I was not welcome with open arms. I was gonna ask you, so and, and you go from anti-establishment to you're the establishment. Yeah, yeah. But did it happen overnight? Or no, did you look a, at yourself and go, holy shit, what happened to me? It was a transition. I, first of all, I was really happy um, to get the, uh, a larger salary. I had four kids by that time. And, uh, you know, they're all in schools, in very expensive schools in New York. So uh, getting my salary went up by about 400%. Nice. When I came to Vanity Fair. And I mean, it's, that it's was, always a bonus. That was huge. <laughs> And so, but they, you know, the staff didn't, they didn't trust me at first because they thought we were either too, too mean at Spy or especially too mean about some of the, the people at, at, at Vanity Fair. And, but it took, after two years, they realized that um, um, I kept saying, Kurt did the mean stuff. I did the funny stuff at Spy. He was saying the same thing right. you know, when he was <laughs> transitioning to New York Magazine. So, but after two years, it all worked out and I've been happy for the last 23. It turns out you weren't that mean because then the internet came along and then we yeah, found out really, what, that's, re that's what real meanness was. <laughs> that's absolutely true. Yeah, we were really softening look at it. Yeah. I think some of the stuff you did back then is just gone. Like uh, you'd, you'd write about like Trump, but you would describe him with like two or three just devastating we were, adjectives. Yeah, we were good on, on, on uh, epithets. Like, uh, you know, we call him a short-fingered vulgarian. Right. But and, you had a hundred, uh, hundreds of those. We had a just lot. Little yeah, we had a little factory that just manufactured ones. these. And like, there's a woman who was the wife of the editor of the New York Times. We called her a bosomy, dirty book writer. And these things just sort of <laughs> stuck with people. <laughs> it was great. I remember, especially like I was in college during the, I think most of the heyday. And boy, it make me feel old. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I, I remember like in, you know, it's July, it's the summer and yeah. I have a lot going on yeah. and it'd be like, ah, it's been about a month since the last one. I start going to the mailbox. Like, is it going to be in there? People used to wait in yeah. line in newsstands because oh, they yeah. would run out. Yeah. It was. Some of the stuff yeah. that was in there seems basic now, but it seems basic because you well, guys started it. Well, it was all pre-internet. Yeah. So that made a big difference. You know, we did this thing where we sent checks for 32 cents to about 50 Unbelievable. really wealthy New Yorkers. They were millionaires at the time, they weren't billionaires. And then the ones who cashed the 32 cent check, we wanted to see if they would, uh, if, if, if the ones who cashed the 32 cent check, we decided to send them a 16 cent check to see if they would cash that. And <laughs> the ones who didn't cash the 32 cent check, we sent a 64 cent check, thinking that, that that may encourage them to take the time to write do their signature and write for a deposit only on the back of the check and put it in the pile that goes to the bank. And as it, this took a long time to do. It took you because you got to wait for the check to come back, then you got to remail new checks out. And we made up some a name of some company like the National Clearing House or something too. Right. It was on the it's written on the check. And in, at the end of the day, just two people cashed sixteen cent checks, and and one was Adnan Khashoggi, then a very sort of notorious arms dealer, and one was Trump. Incredible. You could say it was admirable that he cashed a, he was he's cautious saying, enough about his money that he cashed a 16 cent check. Or you could say he's money rubbing. Yeah. yeah. He was free money for yeah, him. Didn't yeah, matter how yeah. little it was. I think he needed it at the time. What was the other thing you did with, when you would call the restaurants making fake reservations? Wasn't no, we, that? No, or it was something a, like that. No, right? we had a thing that basically um, how, <laughs> how long it took for somebody to get back to That's you is a I measure mean. of your. <laughs> yeah. Your value to society, and you know, at the time Sylvester Stallone, like Mike Ovitz, would call call back the number in like two seconds because Stallone was you know huge, and uh, you know uh, Joey Bishop, we just we did it, and it wound up like two hundred and sixty days and counting, like it's just nobody had returned his phone call. Uh. But yeah, we just like we were like it was, you know I mean Republicans used to call that sort of humor juvenile. We just thought it was funny. I thought it was hilarious. The the stuff you really flipped it on Hollywood too, with the uh, like Walter Monheit was, was well, all, one of my Walter all time Monheit favorites. Was the a, fake movie critic, seventy year old messenger that we used. It was a he was a, from uh, Eastern Europe and uh, charming. He used to love going to nightclubs. He was and uh, anyway we needed we sort of put a monocle in his eye and, his, and took his photograph and and called him our messenger slash movie critic. 
because there are movie critics like Peter Travers is still working today who just loved every movie he ever yeah. saw because he loved seeing his name on the on the ads on on Friday Thursdays and Fridays in the New York Times blurb specialist. So we just we didn't we we didn't get invitations to the screenings. We just based it on literature the studio issued and and wrote our own little David Camp who's a, who was a writer at Spy and is a writer at Vanity Fair he used to write the Walter Monheit reviews and they're terribly corny and uh, um yeah but Walter was uh, Tommy you know about this they used to be young. like and here's yeah. another person that's coming Oscar <laughs> yeah. you know like all this stupid yeah, yeah no it was a movie about a dog it's yeah. Oscar's going woof woof over <laughs> You know, Benji, the we new used to we used to laugh in college. We would just read all of them and laugh our asses off. That one worked, and then um, the log rolling in our time was another Again, one. Again, pre-internet, and yeah. this, guy, this guy Howard Kaplan would spend days at the uh, Shakespeare and Company in the old Barnes and Noble up in the Upper West Side, looking for one critic who had given a blurb on the back of one book, and then checking that author's books out and see if he'd written a yeah. book for, for, for them. And there was, there was a ton of, and log rolling is just basically, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And it, it still happens but today. Pre, yeah, pre-internet, yeah. this was tough work. The other one, occasionally you would do pictures, it'd be like man at his best. <laughs> And it would be pictures oh, yeah. of guys from all different ages who just it looked like their cock might have been. Or white guys dancing. Yeah. One night and doing it. And Susan Morrison, who's now the deputy editor of The New Yorker, used to do all of that. That was great. Said she had spent hours and hours like looking through pictures just to find the most embarrassing photographs of uh, prominent New Yorkers. Separated birth was another one that's oh, that so a, obvious now, but yeah, at the time yeah. I was like, oh my God, yeah. I've funny always enough, thought. Well, funny enough, I was going through the archives of Vanity Fair and Vanity Fair did a version of that in the 1920s. Wow. Yeah. And we had started because we were sitting at the bar at the Algonquin, at the Blue Bar at the Algonquin, and there was a waiter uh, who looked exactly like the Shah of Iran. We thought, oh my God, let's just do this of like two people who look like each other. We And this is we didn't have a big photo budget, but it was amazing how how good some of these matchups were. Yeah, the spy list was another one that I would study and try to figure uh, out. Yeah, yeah. You just put like eight names together, and I'd have to figure well, out what the connection was. Well, it was, it was like, a good way of not getting sued too. You know, um, it was like people who had reputation for really strange things, either enormous penises or they were coprophiliacs or something. But I felt it was <laughs> it was libel proof because. In order to sue us over that list, you'd be saying these other people had the same thing going on right. as well. Nobody would sue over like the fact you're on a list of men with enormous penises. Or it could be like, I mean, I'm sure you had one week it was all people had cocaine problems or... Probably. I mean, that would be everybody in New York. Right, the especially in the mid-80s, like, yeah. Uh, yeah, the phone book. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, did you ever do a spy list where it was just, there w actually wasn't any rhyme or reason? No, no, names? I think. It always had a reason? But I go back, I look at the, if I'm looking through an old issue and I see a list, I have no idea why those names are together now. That's You hilarious. just forget. I mean, even if I look back two months later, I wouldn't know. And then you guys did the spy list. The which I mean, the uh, like the top hundred, the Spy One Hundred, yeah, Spy One Hundred, and yeah. uh, which at a time when lists weren't really a big thing, now it's like the internet is just filled with lists. Yeah, left this and right. was, yeah, and, and I think the um, Chris Elliott was on the first cover, and we had uh, we had a list of the ten most annoying. Uh, not not Chris was just pretending to be annoying, but we had the ten. We started off with a list: the ten most annoying New Yorkers, and Trump was on that. Oh uh, yeah. Trump was a target. It, it, yeah. How much, because drugs, especially cocaine, was so big, late 70s through the 80s, yeah. basically. Yeah, not at the spy offices. But how much of it, like in coverage and stuff, did you... Um, it, it sort of was, because it was so prevalent, it wasn't that big of a, a thing. And since we weren't we weren't part of the drug culture, A, we couldn't afford it, B, right. you know, some of us had young families and, and uh, uh, see that... that you couldn't put out a magazine like that on with any kind of drugs. How much? So the first year you're doing Spy, how many people are working for you, and how much did it cost? How much yeah. did it cost to do an issue? Well, I, I don't. We I remember that the food budget of one Annie Leibovitz photo shoot when I got to Vanity Fair, the the catering budget was equivalent to what we put an entire issue of Spy. Oh for. my God! Yeah, one issue. There was one issue. The curtain I basically wrote the whole thing ourselves 
under various pseudonyms. And um, so, oh, I remember that from the book. So we had, you know, we had like we had like four or five major adults, and then about twenty five um, in, like intern slash assistants who were paid fifty dollars a week. ZipRecruiter, are you hiring? Post your job, find the best candidates, find the best talent. You can post to 100 plus job sites with just one click. We should do this. Their powerful technology efficiently matches the right people to your job. See, uh, unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you. It finds them. In fact, over 80% of jobs posted on ZipRecruiter get a qualified candidate in just 24 hours. No juggling emails or calls to your office. Simply screen, rate, and manage candidates all in one place with ZipRecruiter's easy-to-use dashboard. Right now, my listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash BS. That is ZipRecruiter.com slash BS. We should put the fall internships on there. I never paid you for basically ripping off Spy Magazine in college. I did <laughs> my freshman year in college. I did a dorm newsletter that was just all these different articles I wrote about everybody on our, on our floor. Oh, yeah. And it was basically, it was, oh, I yeah. was just trying to be spy magazine. I'm sure you had a million people yeah. trying to do that. The statue of limitations. Is yeah. I, I, I might mail you a commemorative yeah, copy. I'd love it. It yeah. was called the velvet edge because like the second week I was in college, everybody was watching some porn movie in somebody's room called the velvet edge. And our RA was in there and some girl saw him in there and ratted him out and he got kicked off campus. Okay, yeah, yeah. So it became the, the velvet, velvet edge, edge became yeah. the obvious yeah, name yeah, for yeah. my version of yeah, spy like magazine. It, yeah. It's a pretty good name. Yeah, I think it's a great name. But uh, how did you get started though? with spy, like what was your, what, what was your job before spy? I was a time magazine and like a, like a fledgling writer fledgling or fledgling writer time. What? And, um, it was an amazing time in being at time in those days because you had um, Kurt was there, Jim Kelly, who later became the editor of Time, was there. Rick Stengel, who later became the editor of Time, then worked in the State Department, was there. Walter Isaacson, uh, the writer, and uh, was there. He became the editor of Time. Uh, Michiko Kakutani, the chief book critic of the New York Times, was there. Maureen Dowd was there. Wow. Frank Rich was there. And it Frank was, Rich. Yeah, it was amazing. And so, and we're all still friends. Yeah. And then you go. Oh, so then I'm at Time, and uh, then I went to Life magazine, and then Kurt and I would have lunch, and I would tell we'd talk about this magazine. How'd you know Kurt? From Time. Okay. And um, uh, and we're godfathers to each other's children, and um, so then we in about 1985 we started really talking seriously about that, and we brought in a partner, Tom Phillips, who had worked at, at Rothschild Bank and at. Goldman Sachs, and he helped us put together a business plan. And what we was the one the sentence money. pitch? It was a satirical monthly about the characters who made up the, New York. And New York was filled with many more characters than it is now. It's now filled with bankers and, yeah. and lawyers. I mean, it's it's like Geneva with dirt right now. I mean, And a lot of them were acting... It's hard to believe this, they but were behaving no, much more Yeah, they more were really... This than, is pre-internet, and they yeah. were... They were showing off their money and showing off themselves in a way that made it very entertaining for a journalist. Like Gordon Gecko from Wall Street. Yeah, yeah. He's kind of like heroic in that movie, but he's actually a horrible <laughs> it person. It wasn't intended as yeah, heroic, yeah, yeah. but he like did Like Michael become, Douglas wins the Oscars. Like, yeah, oh, I yeah. kind of like this Gordon no, Gecko. and he became a role model for Wall Street bankers. Right. Um, but, you know, people like Leona Helmsley, who was a big real estate force in the city at the time, most of them are, they, all but Trump are pretty much gone. Did you feel like you ride this magazine for three to four years and it takes you somewhere better? No. Like, because, what was your strategy? No, actually, we thought we were burning every bridge we could possibly imagine. That's how I felt reading it. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. no. And we thought, we'll just do this forever. And uh, without really thinking that, that um, there's basically no future for a standalone magazine in this world. Most yeah. magazines are part of larger companies. We were so stupid. We didn't know that you could go to a fashion company and borrow clothes for a photo shoot. So we would like when we had, I remember having um, Milton Berle on, we had to go shopping for clothes for Milton Berle. We had to buy them at like the, the men's warehouse uh, to, to find a, a suit that would fit him. Big, big underwear, too, for big, Milton. Huge, huge cock. He was on that world. list, yeah. yes. <laughs> Him and Secretariat. Man yeah. at his best. Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, uh, so anyway, we, we there were so many things we just didn't know. So you needed a COO, basically. 
we needed somebody who knew more about that aspect of the world than we did. We knew yeah. about our world that we were students of, that is, say, adult New York, and then California. And, it, um, and we used to just drive some of these people crazy because we'd, we'd fact check things as much as we could, but we didn't ask for comments. So people would just, <laughs> the stories on them would just be in the magazine without any warning whatsoever. They have no idea. And Mike Obitz would have conniptions and he hired a, he was the most powerful agent in Hollywood at the time he ran CAA and he hired a private detective to try to find out who this person, Celia Brady was, who was writing. Who was not a real person, right? It was a real person, but not, yeah. yeah, yeah. It was actually a man who was Celia Brady. Possibly. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so he tried, he died in the, I remember one point, we assigned a, a, a reporter and a, and a friend of theirs, I, they worked on this for an entire year, to do the CAA client list. CAA at that time represented everybody, but nobody had, even the partners there, had except for one, had seen the entire list of all their clients and they had everybody. So the, the, we worked for a year on this and ran it over, I guess a page or a page and a half. It was, it was everybody you could imagine it was big at the time. And they had to shut the agency down for about 10 days wow. just to call the shock of the client seeing all the other people in their little category. Like if you represent both, um, um, you know, Al Pacino and Dustin Hoffman, Dustin Hoffman is realizing Al Pacino is getting these parts he's not getting and vice versa. So they had to, a lot of like hand holding for about 10 days after that list was published. You caused some chaos. Yeah, that was great. Who is the maddest that you'd think? Ovitz is in the top five. Trump, I would guess. Trump, yeah. Trump would threaten a lot. And um, although when I got to Vanity Fair, he invited me to his wedding. So he realized that he better... He, that Which he, wedding? Both. I was invited to both the Marla Maples wedding and the Melania Trump wedding. Well, because you took that... You had that one cover of Ivanka where it yeah, was just that was, the all-time close-up of her face. That was really <laughs> like her, mean. Her face is... That was, <laughs> was probably the meanest thing you it, did. It was It was really... And she went and got... Had everything redone after that. Oh, no. Everything. I mean, you... The silicon uh, was on your hands. No, it's... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so she... So she... I just lost my voice crack. No, she went and did, then Vogue magazine did a photograph, a whole photo shoot of her sort of redone Bridget Bardot style. She had everything fixed. Okay. Um, it peaked, I'm going to say you had like a four-year apex? Five. Five-year apex? Yeah, it ran for nine years. We did When we did our history, we called it Spy the Funny Years, and it was most yeah. of the first five years. What, so tell the story of what happened that compromised the funniness. No, nothing happened. We left. You left. We sold the magazine to Charles Saatchi, the advertising, British advertising king, and Johnny Pagazzi, uh, who was the heir to the Simca car fortune. They bought it and they wanted to turn it into Vanity Fair. And I wanted to, actually at that time, I want, then I wanted to start up a twice a week newspaper in New York. And so I was on a listening tour for that. And um, the fellow who owned the New York Observer said, look, why don't you learn on the job? I'm come and edit this for me. So I left, and uh, then Kurt left and ran for another four years. But why'd you leave? Because, you know, if the you grind? own something uh, for five years and run it completely the way you see fit, then all of a sudden you're working for somebody else. It's just a different a change, and I didn't want to work for uh, Did anybody. you have to sell, or you just yeah, felt like did. it was the time? We ran out of money. Okay. Yeah, we did ran out of money, like the magazine lost money? It was too successful, and this is gonna sound strange. We had planned, we had, we had budgeted, we raised the money and, and budgeted for a magazine that would have a circulation of 25,000 copies. Because the magazine business is really rough. You print, you spend all the money paying the writers, the photographers, yeah. you s print those magazines, you send them out to newsstands, and you don't get a check back from the ones you've sold for 90 days. So. All, we planned to just do it in a, it used to be called platforming in the movies, where they'd open in a couple of theaters in New York and a couple of theaters in Los Angeles, and then spread as the reviews came in. So we had planned for us, we had budgeted for 25,000 copies on the newsstand, or circulation in total, and it, within the third issue, we were getting requests from like, you know, San Francisco and Los Angeles and London, and, and so we were printing 150,000 copies 
Wow. Uh, and waiting for all that, you know, all those sales to come back in and it became, uh, it just became really difficult. Subscriptions couldn't have helped you? We had a lot of I mean, subscriptions. You had a, I know, I subscribed. Yeah, we had a lot of subscribers, but it, uh, you know, that was a really, um, there was a lot of detail that went into that magazine. Yeah. What would you do differently if you did it over again? I would, um, I'd probably align with a larger company, possibly. From the get-go? I'd also do, you know, this is a horrible thing, I'd do fashion shoots because they're the people who advertise. Interesting. And we weren't going to get ads from U.S. Steel or General Tire, but we could have if we had played our cards better, gotten ads from, you know, Ralph Lauren and... Um, yeah, I think it would have been hard to juggle it would, being it, the all-time outsider, but yeah, then it, also... Yeah, no, no, I don't it, know how yeah. you do it. It was impossible. It was difficult. Because... You know, I think of that era. We had era. a blast, though. Oh, it's amazing. Oh, my God. We had so much fun. I think of that era, and it's just Letterman, and it's like Seinfeld and all those comedians coming up, and it's you guys, and it's just comedy just shifted. It was that Johnny Carson era of comedy. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Was all of a sudden gave way. Letterman, the age of irony, and then the age of being ironic about yeah. irony, and then it just kind of... <laughs> and by the end of the decade, we were in a totally different place. Yeah. And it was, it was the place I wanted to be. Yeah. No, it's funny, looking with back at the 80s, it does look like a a real moment in time. Even movies look so different now. Yeah. All the men in their dockers or, you know, Ralph Lauren chinos and a lot of people with ties, big ugly ties, but wearing ties. Yeah, even you look at the comedies from back then and what was the movement that was going on didn't really transfer into the comedies the movie comedies until the next decade. Well, it almost like it took five well, years. We had like extra. Friends and Seinfeld on NBC on right. Thursday. Right, that was night the 90s, though. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers was 80s, wasn't it? Cheers was 80s. Yeah. Cheers was old school. Oh, yeah. It was, it was like the really, last great old school really awesome well sitcom. Yeah. yeah, it's still, yeah, you can yeah. watch Cheers now and it's yeah. still good. Yeah, yeah. It, all, it wasn't even a sitcom. It was like a, just a funny Same show. Same thing with Fraser. It's beautifully yeah. written. Yeah. yeah. Um, so when are you doing up at Vanity Fair? I forget. 1992. And, um, and I, you know, I was but thrilled. not running it, right? Yeah, or, yeah, I'm running it. Yeah. Oh yeah, you're right. That's 25 years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you immediately got the job running it. Yeah, I was hired by Cy. He uh, he hired me actually to be the editor of the New Yorker, and uh, and I sort of went home every night and canceled everything and planned what I would do for the first six months and it came with a six month, twelve month, eighteen month plan, and then the day it was supposed to be announced. Um, I was told that it was going to be Vanity Fair and I had no plan. And so, and I didn't know enough that if I'd said, I need three months to, or a couple of months to figure out what I'm going to do. I would have, I wasn't sure whether they'd pay me for those two months or not. And I needed a paycheck. So right. I started right away. You had 13 kids at that point. I had you 13 needed, had kids at that point. Nursery schools <laughs> and preschools. Yeah. yeah. So I, I actually, yeah, my tuition bills, were almost as much as my salary. But what was then. Vanity Fair in 1992? It was what did a, you walk into? It was a you know, successful magazine. It had not made money, but it was a successful magazine. And it, uh, it was very emblematic of the 1980s. So that was the first thing. And I, the 90s hadn't really defined themselves. So you're, you're both trying to figure out your own vision and what, the, what time you're in. And it... They're not, you know, decades don't really define themselves until you're probably halfway through them. Yeah. So the, the 90s, as it turned out, the 90s were a, a curious, peaceful, prosperous decade. Yeah. With a, you know, very decent president. Pre decent meaning competent. Right. And the, and the internet economy is starting to take off. That yeah. helps. Yeah. Russia's completely fallen apart and hasn't tried to rebuild yeah. itself. Yeah, no, we were on top of the power. world. Yeah. And then and you had you know, America and Britain were, you know, two great powerhouses. So it, it took a while. But, but then when I settled in, Cy offered me The New Yorker again in 19, um, 1999. And I was just turning 50. And all I could think of was getting this. I'd ordered a Saab convertible. Five, five speed sub I bet it broke down a birthday. bunch of times no no I, and I was just I wanted to be delivered on Friday so I could take it over to the country I was so looking forward to it and then Cy offered me the job on the Thursday and I realized after thinking about it for 24 hours that I was much more interested in getting this Saab convertible than I was in changing jobs yeah so that was a I loved my Saab convertible by the way and you loved your job and I loved my job so yeah one of the things 
I think when people think about the reign you had there is you just went after great writers and you paid them yeah. properly. Yeah. But did they do that before you showed up or was that yeah, something no, that was, table? I mean, Connie Nass was then starting to really assert itself. And most of the other magazine companies like Time Inc., most of the writers were house writers. You're paid a salary, you were a salaried employee. But I, you know, I immediately went after the first two people I called were Christopher Hitchens and Brian Burrow. And Brian then was the king of, of sort of business uh, narrative journalism, and he still is one of them. And um, and and wanted Christopher, and then I asked Frank DeFord, it was probably the third one. I loved Frank, but he didn't, it wasn't a fit of Vanity it was the wrong, Yeah, it was the wrong time in his yeah, career. Yeah, 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 he was better in 1956. He was good any time, but I, it, uh, and he was such a wonderful gent. That uh, 70s, mm. 80s long form, yeah, of, yeah. it's almost like a short story. Yeah, that's all, That kind yeah. of started to fade in the Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Bit. So, but it, I mean, I think of like Dominic Dunn Dominic, as the well, ultimate example of like, I have to get Vanity Fair. I want to read it. I cared more about his OJ takes than anyone in my life. I want to hear from him only. Well, he, that and then the Menendez brothers. That's that was he before, really, yeah, before yeah, that, right? He really yeah. made his name, and uh, he was he was vital to the to the whole thing. And the care and feeding of Dominic was a big part of the job. He. It's funny, like he was in the OJ FX series, played brilliantly by yeah. Robert Morris. Yeah, and 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 he was in it, and he was probably in it more than people understood why I was in it. Yeah, and yeah. I felt like he wasn't in it enough. You could have done was like his the, version too. Yeah, he yeah. was. There was really nobody else covering the no. story correctly. No, Tubin did a good job with his book. Yes, and I think he wrote some stuff too, but. Dominic Dunn, it was like he became the O.J. Whisperer, and he everybody was, was just feeding was. him stuff, and you never knew it was true and, and not he true. he looks sort of like like your friendly uncle, you know. He has yeah. that look, you know. I mean, Dominic's an interesting guy, you know. He he was a he was a D Day. He was during, he fought in the Battle of the Bulge. I mean, his he, daughter got murdered. Got a daughter and that got murdered. Led him into the Menendez yeah, yeah. trial and the whole. Th I mean. And his, uh, Griffin, his son, is you know, is a friend of mine. He's doing really well. It's just a really interesting family. But they have a, they had a, you know, the, he had a, a long term falling out with his brother John Gregory Dunn. But then yeah. they made up near the end of John's life. And um, but Dominic was very much the uh, Dominic and Annie Leibovitz were the very much the franchise of the mid '90s. Did you steal Annie Leibovitz, or was she already there? No, she was there. Yeah, she and, left. Yeah, she was a uh, Connie Nass contract photographer and the principal photographer at the magazine. I remember I was living in Boston in, during the whole OJ thing and obviously not really making any money and I'm, I'm reading these Dominic Dunn just so then I was at this cocktail party at a famous yeah, yeah. And, and just his life I was so fascinated by it was it was like the opposite of my life well, it's like every night he's in Bel Air in some mansion and <laughs> yeah. and I was just like man I, I, I wish there I were just cameras following this yeah, guy around yeah. he's so every day he's going to a different dinner and they're talking about OJ yeah. And I want to be at all of these dinners. I just want to overhear it. And that's what he became for a year and a half. Yeah, he was the guy. He was very high in high demand out here yeah. socially. You know, it's funny. Things are strange. I remember when Klaus von Bülow was um, tried for trying to kill his wife. You know, when he went back to London after that trial, he was like, you know, a big social get there. And yeah. in New York. Right. It seemed like... At some point, there, there became a recipe, and I don't mean that as a negative way, but like the typical Vanity Fair issue. Oh, no, absolutely. It, it always hit a we couple call it of a formula. Beats. Yeah, yes. right. formula, I guess you could say too. Yeah, but it was like a every once in a while. European, yeah, you have a to have some sort, of, some sort of European. His wife mysteriously died. Yeah, yeah, no. We and then there's that. money missing, yeah. and there's that one, yeah. but then the big celebrity profile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, then the gritty Michael Lewis. Yeah, yeah. Things are about to go really bad in this way. Yeah, yeah. You hit like your seven buttons that you would yeah. just. Yeah, it's a, Go quite, to. it's a slight form that we try to vary from me. You want to be both consistent in, in a certain way without being too predictable. Maybe sometimes we'd got too predictable. There were but, certain stories that would happen, though, where we'd be like, I'm clearly going to be reading about this at Vanity Fair four years, four months from now. Yep, yep. They will, they will have some When rich giant people thing. kill other rich people, that's 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 our turf. One I of remember, our areas of turf. Well, uh, the Tiger Woods car crash with the wife. Yes. I remember thinking... This is the ultimate Vanity Fair story. I don't know if they'll be able to get this one. Well, also, Annie had shot him for an American Express ad that never ran. And we were trying to figure out what to do. And then she called and said, you know, I do have this photograph. So she sends it over and him looking 
really menacing with his shirt off. And we ran it and American Express was just livid with us because they had basically paid for the photograph and I hadn't really signed off on it being used for anybody else. And, um, but yeah, but you, know, you read something like Tiger, what do you say? Yeah, that's a good story for us. Do you have like, is there a favorite issue you ever had of Vanity Fair? Cause no. I know like at Grantland and at the ringer, I've had favorite days, right? Yeah. Just like we fucking killed it that day. Yeah. I mean, you don't have one issue where you're like, no, that I is like the best I, issue this we ever is did. It's going to sound, make me sound like a real ass, but I, I remember talking to John F. Kennedy Jr. on the phone and then telling him I had to get off the line because the Princess of Wales was on the other line. That was uh, that I remember. Wow. Yeah, that was that was something. Yeah. Princess Diana probably yeah. made a few appearances in Vanity Fair. She did a lot, years, actually. Before her, and most, after. her most famous photographs appeared in Vanity Fair. These ones taken by Mario Testino, which are sort of the defining pictures of her in the last, say, 10 years of her life. Hold on, we can take a quick break to talk about our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. They understand that home plays a big role in your life and family. That's why they created Rocket Mortgage, which gives you the confidence you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. It's simple and allows you to fully understand all the details and be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you, whether you're looking to buy your first home or your 10th. With Rocket Mortgage, you get a transparent online process that gives you the confidence to make an informed decision. Their trusted partners allow you to share your financial information with Rocket Mortgage at the touch of a button, get a real mortgage approval in minutes, adjust the rate and length of your loan in real time to make sure you're getting the right solution for you. That's Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Apply simply, understand fully, mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash Bill Simmons, equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org, number 3030. When did, maybe it was already the case, but obviously Hollywood, there's a movie coming out. They want to blow out this particular celebrity. Yeah, yeah. Was that already in place when you were there? Because yeah. you've taken advantage of it well, year after year. You know, the thing is, the ma magazine has a, a big global audience. We sell a lot of copies in Europe and the Far East and, um, and Australia and Canada. And the only international language of celebrity right now is, um, I, with the exception of a couple of music stars, are movie stars. Everybody has their own TV stars. You go to Italy, they'll have the number one show you've never even heard of the people on it. Yeah. And they wouldn't know who Deborah Messing is, say. Or, um, and you can't, sports stars are different in every country. Writing stars are different. Movie stars is the only, it's the only international face currency. And so we were stuck with that. And we were stuck with um, the position of having to sell, selling a lot of copies on the newsstand. Who was the all-time go-to celebrity? That like you're like, oh, they're on the cover. I know this is going to sell the most. Well, we did. We, we, well, and just I think Madonna was on probably six times. That was the '90s. Um, um, Jennifer Aniston was the biggest selling cover of all time after she broke post, up with Brad Pitt. Post Brangelina. No, is Brad, that what we're saying yeah. now? That she broke up with Brad Pitt? She, well, no, when she broke. Oh, when that, Brad, well, whoever broke up with who. Uh, we, we, who are you talking about now? I just felt like Brad Pitt started kind of dating Angelina Jolie when he was married to Jennifer Anderson. I had known nothing about <laughs> that. <laughs> you had a little See, overlap. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I'm reading the, reading between the lines. Yeah, that's a possibility. Uh, a lot of a lot of sexual tension on yeah. the set, and they just immediately start He's a dating. Good-looking man and a high handsome man. man. Yeah, yeah, he has needs. Yeah. She's on the front yeah. set. Who knows? Yeah, yeah I, I look like Brad Pitt. I would be showering on YouTube every day. <laughs> I think Brangelina was the greatest thing that happened to the magazine industry in the 2000s. Us well, Weekly, it you pushed know, to Jan the final levels. described it to me with the, just how Us Weekly would uh, define something. So you'd get the the first part is the, the them getting together. So you've got them together, then photos together, and then what are they going to do together? So you got like six months of that. Yeah. Then when they break up, the you tear. got you got alternating issues for like another six months or a year after that. Then who are they dating? So it just it it um it just, it's yeah it just feeds like a giant amoeba. You guys wrote about that culture a couple times. Never. No, about the us the celebrity culture, the Us Weekly, the whole. We I wrote remember. we wrote about the nineties, calling it the tabloid decade. But we yeah, never, yeah, yeah, we never did. I mean, if you looked at a copy of Us Weekly, no, I'm not saying you wrote about yeah. like Brangelina. No, no I, you wrote about the culture of that, yeah. Well, that if whole you thing. funny if you check like a copy, I'm just guessing a copy of Us magazine or People magazine from 2003. You know, those are authentically famous people on the cover. Yeah. 
you look at it now and you say, I have no idea why I'm lucky at this person and I don't know who they are. Yeah, they were trapped in a well and now they yeah, escaped. The <laughs> People Magazine yeah. has an archives of all their stuff from the 70s, 80s, basically since they came out. And it's really interesting to read how they wrote about people in the 70s and 80s and how much more forthcoming celebrities were. You read about how like Three's Company, Suzanne Summers holding out. Right. But the way they would write about it, it was like reading a, a report. Well, you're a real And real quotes. This. Yeah, yeah. I was, I'm always fascinated to see how the trends would, train, well, change. Well, you know, it's funny because you look at Life magazine in the, in the 40s and 50s and photographers like William Claxton who go spend like three weeks with Steve McQueen. Yeah. It, it's very, very different. Now it's like part of an industrial complex. It, it, it's um, that, that, And that's what TV Guide even would have stuff like that. But yeah. now... I think, and we see it in sports, especially, you know, these guys are also savvy with how, who well, they're the spending internet, their time they with of, and why. Well, the internet makes them have to be savvy. Yeah. It's like, it's time for my magazine profile. All right. I'm going to call Lee Jenkins from Sports okay, Illustrated. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to give him four hours right. and he'll write the magazine profile yeah. about me. And yeah. then... And then Cross that check off, and now we got to do a podcast. Hmm, which podcast should yeah, we do? Yeah. And they just do this little playbook. Yeah. But in the seventies and eighties, I, I think a lot of the times people be like, "Oh yeah, I'll talk to you," you know. And well, there's no such thing as a podcast. Away. You know, the, yeah. the, the media was owned in large part by mom and pop operators. I mean, you know, it was like family owned. The L.A. Times, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the, the networks were even owned uh, were family owned operations. So. Yeah. It was a much, you know, it's a, a not necessarily a better time. It was a simpler time. Well, magazines are in a lot of trouble. Magazines are in a transitional period. Yes. You must have been feeling some of that the last couple of years. Yeah, I mean, I think Vanity Fair has escaped um, uh, the damage that's uh, that's afflicted a lot of the uh, other magazines, but we're not immune. But you're owned by Condé Nast, which yeah, I think yeah. has had some issues with some yeah. of the other oh, properties. Yeah. No, that, no, no, it's question. um, it's a um. It's a very tough market right now. When did you, Vanity Fair had this ability to just parachute in once a month and they could tackle the big story, but then also some evergreen story and just hit all these different things. When did you start noticing that the world, the content world was just moving so fast? Like you might have this story coming, but the way it was being dissected in real time was almost altering how that story, like it was almost making it dated before it came out. Well, it's funny because, you know, most of the, the um, um, if running a monthly magazine in an internet age, especially during this period of like uh, this administration, it's, it's, um, it's a real challenge. So you've got to choose something that might take two or three months to report and edit. It, then it takes you like a couple of weeks to close it, going through legal review and fact checking. And then it's going to be on a newsstand for a month. So you've got to it's you've got to choose aspects of the culture that are very much in the air, and and, and uh, but that have a, a shelf space beyond the the news blast you get on your phone. And and you know the the New York Times and the Washington Post are in just a rabid competition, very healthy, yeah. of, over this administration. So you you're also you're just your phone is just pinging constantly with a the Washington Post or the New York Times. And so we have to do, like Michael Lewis is doing this series for us right now that I think will have a long and lasting impact. So we don't chase news. We, we yeah. make news occasionally, but we don't chase the news because we're a monthly with a daily um, a, a website, The Hive, that, that is operates more like a, a newspaper. Right. And how's that, The Hive you really started investing in, I would say, three years ago? Two years ago. Two years ago? Yeah. Okay. It's doing very well, and it's a you know young group, and uh, with some three, four star writers like um, Nick Bilton and Sarah Ellison and uh, William D. Cohan, and uh, but it's it it does really well. It goes up like I don't I don't know, I don't know how many it gets a lot every month. And you feel like it has its own identity separate from yeah. The and we're gonna invest more in it, and we just hired Gabe Sherman, uh, who's a brilliant reporter, and this guy Joe Pompeo. So it's got so a great two good staff. Hires, by the way. Yeah, they're yeah. pretty good. Gabe uh, Sherman's good. Oh, he's amazing. Yeah, he's got a story that's coming at like lunchtime today. That's oh pretty, really? Oh god, yes. Yeah. Well, we're not running this podcast, so you can. You oh, can say my we, god. I mean, we're running it probably next week, so you can I say. I think it's live right now. Is it? <laughs> What's the story? <laughs> oh yeah, uh, Bannon and Trump. I mean, and just and. Yeah, I mean, anyway. So, did you ever write about Harvey Weinstein, like in a in a really? 
big way or not, not really? really? No, I knew those rumors were out there. I never had any. You knew that he's my next. He's my cross the street neighbor in New York. So I see him all the time. Oh, what were your experiences with him? When we became neighbors, much better. He, we'd had a very antagonistic relationship up to that point. I mean, very antagonistic. From Vanity Fair? From Vanity Fair and Spy. In fact, I remember I would hear From one Spy? year. From Spy? Oh yeah, we wrote about him in Spy. Yeah. I didn't even know. And I didn't even know he really the, was. And of the Observer, which is ah. uh, I was there in 1991, and um, uh, very antagonistic. And uh, when we became neighbors, it became friendly because you can't have an enemy living across the street. So yeah. it, it settled down dramatically after that. But I'm sure you heard a lot of rumors, and I heard things rumor, out there. I heard and all rumors, that stuff. but I never attached, not ever attached to like a proper noun. So it wasn't you'd. I mean, you could sort of guess. I mean, you know, there's yeah. a British comedian called Jimmy Savile. And once he was arrested as a pedophile, you'd say, like, what, you couldn't get this, realize this before? And he was all dressed in chains and a tracksuit constantly. And he was, he was just, it looked a bit like Marty Feldman. He was just, he was a strange looking guy. And, and yeah. um, uh, I had no idea that this was going on at this, at this level. But if I owned the Peninsula Hotel here, I'd tear out all those bathtubs. Because you don't want to be sitting in a bathtub that Harvey Weinstein oh, couldn't sleep again, like you know. <laughs> the, the uh, away, you know. The 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 whole establishment that he was part of, it feels like it's shifting. Like whatever has happened with the Trump allegations last year, the Trump tape, um, the stuff that's happened with Harvey, just women coming out. It does feel like this is this is kind of the pivotal sea change. We're taping this uh, October 10th. Pivotal sea change week for things are ne never going to be the same with this stuff now. It'd be People good are going to come that, out immediately. It'd, it'd be good if that was the case. And, and um, you know, I, um, weird thing is Harvey has young daughters almost the age of some of these girls. And, you know, I have a 23-year-old daughter. She worked at the Weinstein Company three summers ago when she was in college. And um, she said it was so chaotic that she never even saw Harvey. Yeah. She said they didn't even have desks for the interns. They had to work on their knees when they bring their own computers to work. Did you follow how the New Yorker and the Times were basically competing to see who could get this story out first? Have you ever been involved with something like that? Oh, all the time. Constantly. Well, you know somebody else is doing the same thing, you but you're know. on a monthly schedule. Yeah, but, you always, but then we can release. Now with the internet, we can release it the moment it's ready. We have that. You have that at least once every couple of months. What's the best example of that? I can't even think of it anything right now, but I know we when we broke the deep throat story. Yeah, I was. That was a big thing because that's a, one of the great mysteries of journalism. I was so we, upset that you broke that. Why? I never wanted to know. I realized that's after it. I, I found out that I, I never know wanted to know. Yeah, it was so much more fun not knowing. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. It's almost like the JFK assassination. I kind of never want to know. Yeah, I was going to have my weird theory. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll probably never yeah. know. Um, no, but he, this guy, this lawyer, calls me and says I. I represent a man who was um, d deep throat in, during the Watergate um, reporting. And I said, I we get a lot of nut calls. So I turned it over to um, one of my editors, David Friend, who, and he and I worked together forever. We used to work at Life Magazine together. And um, so we spent two years on this. We're like 80, 95% sure that we had, uh, that this Mark Felt was the guy. And I, uh, I Carl Bernstein was on my master, but I couldn't call Carl because I worried that he would then call Bob Tip and would Bob would in. like have it the paper the next day. We yeah. have a monthly magazine. There was no internet to speak of at the time. This is 2005. And we closed the, the story. We, we secretly photographed him using a, um, the husband of the head of the, of the head of the photo department. And I go on my honeymoon and we, my wife and I go to the Bahamas for our honeymoon. I forgot all about this. We we're on the in the airport coming back and I didn't even have a cell phone in those days. And um, my wife gets a ping on her cell phone and she has a little flip phone and, she, and it's my office saying, uh, the editor who'd been working on a David Friend saying that, you know, we're, we're releasing the story in about three minutes. And I said, oh fuck, I forgot all about that. And so we're, their plane was delayed and my wife's cell phone battery was going down and David called back, he said, it's gone up. Woodward and Bernstein say they're going to make a statement in a half an hour. 
So we have to wait there. Oh God. And I thought if I get this wrong, this is like, I'm cooked. And just as we were getting to adding towards the gate, uh, my wife's phone rang again and, and it was New York saying, they just said, yep, Mark felt his deep throat. And I, so I got on the plane. I was so happy. I had on that short flight, I must've had like five vodkas on the plane. <laughs> I was so relieved. It's just, it was a big thing. I was, I'm a huge Watergate junkie. I went through two different phases in the nineties. I never, I actually always thought Deep Throat was like three different people that emerged a together. Concept, yeah, that's what I thought. Because yeah. Mark felt was so obvious if it was just one person. Yep. Like if you really studied it, it was like, all right, if somebody's leaking this stuff to Woodward, like it's gotta be somebody that, that actually gains from this or is trying to get revenge in some petty yes. way. And he was the guy. It was, there was, it yes. wasn't Al Haig. No, that's true. Mark felt was the only one who yes. had a reason to be the leaker. And it was like, well, if, if it was him, it would have come out. So it had to have been four different people. Well, a lot of people and then thought, it was him. A lot of people thought it was a, a sort of a narrative device dreamed up by Alice Mayhew, the the editor of the book, yeah. um, who's a, a great nonfiction editor at, at Simon and Schuster, and um, yeah, I mean, and Mark. By the time we ran the story, Mark was suffering from yeah, dementia. He was, that was one of the reasons he did it. He wanted money for yeah, his family. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and then they, I don't know if you've seen the movie. The movie is good. Decent movie. I haven't movie. seen the movie. Yeah. I've read some. Somebody wrote a, a pretty good takedown of Mark Fell. I can't remember where I read it that I actually agreed with. Like, kind of kind of undermined the country in some ways because he was being petty about the fact that but he was not promoted. Over. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there there is definitely. Yeah. The motives, truth to the that. motives weren't as good as the, no. as the result. No, and, and also the movie doesn't, and I love the movie and I've probably seen that movie, it's in my top 20 of yeah, most yeah, times I've seen a movie, yep. but it does discount like he was also dealing with, I think it was the New York Times too, the New York Times. Yeah, yeah. And he was feeding stuff to them and it was really the Washington Post New York Times yep. together. Yeah. But in terms of just pulling off that movie, it's still an amazing achievement. An incredible so many movie And the fact pieces. that, you know, the Woodward and Bernstein never, ever um, laid eyes on um, Nixon in, in, in real life. Yeah. Ever. Once. There's no confrontation, which makes the whole thing even more um, remarkable that it could be so dramatic. Whereas if you look at the people from the Times, like Maggie Haberman, she's wandering into Trump's office like five times a day. Um, when did you feel like you were part of the establishment officially? When you got the job or a couple years later? No, not, I, I don't feel like I am part of the establishment. Nah, you are. I mean, um, um, let's be honest. You, uh, Lorne Michaels, like there, there's these certain guys the that Canadian are kind of. Canadian establishment, yeah. <laughs> Canadian <laughs> I feel like I'm part of the Canadian. No, but these the Canadian in America establishment. Power players. I'm not a power player. And, and uh, you know, I. Um, I would say you're a power player. Okay. I mean, I, I don't know. I, there's certain people in, in who have really great jobs. Many of them are based in New York. Yeah. You all know each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't know. It's a no, thing. No, 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 yeah. It's funny. I felt the, the time I remember when I first came to New York and uh, I had a green card. <coughs> Excuse me. And I remember applying for and then receiving in the mail, going home and getting the letter and opening it. It was my uh, Brooks Brothers credit card. That made me feel <laughs> that you're better real than just about anything wow. that's happened since. Do you feel like New York versus LA is a thing? I think Los Angeles is the American city right now, not New York. I've been preaching this to. It's funny when we started Grantland in two thousand eleven. Not just the weather or anything like that. No, nah, when we started Grantland in two thousand eleven, it was really hard to get people to move here. I bet. Young people. There was an Uber here. It was this big sprawling city, and it was intimidating. And over the course of six years, people want to move here now. Absolutely, we can get anyone to move here. And it's a really fun place for a young person to live, which it was not six years ago. Cheap rents. Cheap rents, nice Uber, rents. you can go everywhere yep. you want. Yep. Because the night. New York thing, if you're young in New York, just hop in a cab. And New York's up all night. And LA isn't up all night like that, but it's got a lot of the other pieces down. Well, you know, my first apartment in New York it was down in the, in, the, in the village and I paid, it was a beautiful apartment. It had tall ceilings and a garden and a wall of leaded glass and, and I paid $200 a month. My daughter's apartment was right around the corner, and she was sharing with a friend. It was about the same size, but she was paying five thousand dollars a month. And so the rents in New York are just so atrocious that LA is a very attractive place. Also, I think, strange enough, the overall decline of the movie business 
has allowed other industries to flourish here. Tech, that especially. It doesn't. It yeah. doesn't hang over the city like 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 a giant, you know, a cloud. It's it, there's uh, there's other life here. There's the art world. There's the tech world. You know, a huge TV business. Yeah. And it just feels like a much more vibrant city. And then you, you throw in everything else, like the weather, the palm trees, you know. And uh, sounds like we should start looking for real estate. Yeah, for you. yeah. Where, where do you want to live? Should I start showing you neighborhoods? <laughs> Try, you're the most, you're the best looking podcast operator. I mean, oh my, yeah. You and you know, actually Preet Bahara in New York. He's got a podcast. He's pretty good looking. <laughs> the uh, yeah, I mean, most of he the, doesn't have your blue eyes. Dang, so, I yeah, appreciate I that. Know, yeah, most of the uh, attractive people in in the U.S. live in L.A. I think that's I true. Say. Yeah, I mean, they have almost all the models and actresses. Yeah, I know. Even the studio heads look at uh, people like Bob Iger. I mean, it's like a movie star. Very good posture. On Bob very Iger. good posture. Great, the best. You're the best. You think he runs for president? I don't know. I hope he does. I think he's going to. Yeah. Okay. I think he wanted to own an NFL team, which yeah. explained a lot of the difficulties I had at my previous employer. Okay, okay. Um, and now I think he's going to run for president. I hope he does. It'll be interesting to see him versus Trump. I don't think Trump will be there when this comes around. Really? No, Do I tell. Don't. I mean, I give up making predictions because after the election, but I can't in my life imagine this goes on forever. Because we're all going to get blown up? That, you know, I think that they're going, you know, their they're people will stop that little stubby finger from pressing the, the nuclear codes. I think that... Uh, little stubby uh, finger. His fingers are like that long. <laughs> it's, it's about half the length of a cigarette, you know, he, he, of, of a long cigarette, you know, one of those yeah. Virginia Slims. There's not a lot of nice things to say about him, but one one positive, if you're going to spin things into positives, okay, he got you it. writing a little bit more. He got, yeah. He's been <laughs> you can't, you, he brought your fingers no, no, out of retirement. Yeah, no, yeah, they, I mean, they weren't in, they were in semi-retirement. I, yeah, I, I, semi, I love, I love were, writing about the guy. Oh, yeah. And in fact, you know, I one of the things, of, you know, I'm planning my future, I've got to plan it for a post-Trump world. It's too easy to, you know, for the New York Times and the Washington Post, they are just like in in heaven right now with with this administration but they got a plan to how they're going to have you know how they're going to continue to be successful businesses when he's gone first i want to talk about stamps.com one of our oldest friends maybe we have some old friends on this podcast today convenient easy reliable flexible my favorite words to describe stamps.com why wouldn't you avoid the post office why wouldn't you buy and print official u.s postage with your own computer and printer Sign up with stamps.com. It's the U.S. Postal Service right at your fingertips. Any letter, any package, any class of mail, and you're in control of it. They'll even send you a digital scale that automatically calculates exact postage and helps you decide the best class of mail. I actually get mad whenever I hear people say, yeah, I got to run to the post office. Oh, I just got stuck at the post office. It's insulting. It's 2017. Nobody should go to the post office. Just go to stamps.com. Use my code BS for this special offer a four week trial plus postage plus a digital scale without any long term commitments. Go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage and type in BS. That is stamps.com, enter BS, sign up today. Stamps.com, never go to the post office. Click on the microphone at the top of the stamps.com homepage, type in BS. What do you think about uh, future networks? All the stuff you talk about at the Vanity Fair Summit every year, but future mean? TV networks versus the streaming and places like ESPN, even HBO, these old school powerhouses that are now have these these commerce. Like Netflix is going to spend seven billion dollars yeah. on content this year, and they're you know Netflix or Amazon at some point they're going to start writing checks to the NFL and professional yeah. hockey and professional NFL's baseball. NFL's 2021. Yeah. And they might just say, Amazon just might say, we're taking this. Or and the NFL will just, as you pointed out, they'll just say, we don't even need a network. We, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll own everything ourselves. We'll young John Madden and do the color commentary ourselves. Um, <clears throat> I do know that, you know, like if you give a kid a DVD, they basically don't know what to do with it anymore. It's amazing. And, um, and nobody under 10 they'll look at a dvd like it's a yeah UFO. no they're like it's like a like a gramophone i watch it change with my kids because like my daughter when she was born 2005 and we had this little dvd player I that one. she could was put that, the headphones the, in yeah, and one, she yeah. could watch oh, yeah. it and then eventually on demand started around 08 07 right. 08 where it could be like oh your nickelodeon show put the on yeah, demand yeah. and streaming was just it was like this whole world opened yeah. up so my son who's only he's almost 10 he only knows streaming. Like he doesn't know where cable channels are. 
that my my nine year old daughter's the same way. Yeah, yes. it's like he he goes to YouTube and he goes to Amazon. Yes, I just wrote about this two weeks ago because we were there for Ad Week, and you know, I talked to some of these big CMOs of these different places, and they're they're concerned. They don't know how to reach young people because right. young people are in places that they don't know how to advertise for. How do you advertise for YouTube? When, especially like if YouTube does YouTube Red and you can just skip all the commercials, how well, do they if you speed load ahead? Most kids speed ahead through commercials. Totally. I mean, my daughter watches The Simpsons on and, and on TV on demand, and the ads are for such violent movies. We just tell her immediately just skip ahead. But if you were selling something, what I would do is I would design an ad that may be a fifteen second ad, but it's going to be seen in two seconds, so that it's a stationary thing, no matter how fast you go. That you right. You don't try to get a lot of thoughts and you try to get one simple thought. Like if you were selling Apple, you just like have the Apple logo and nothing else. So that when you like, speed Apple, ahead. Apple, iPhone 10 coming yeah. now. <laughs> and then it's so, over. But it's just that one logo. That yeah. For the, see, when you speed ahead, it doesn't it, I think change. that's where it's, I think that we're heading, you're seeing some of it in sports now. You're seeing in, during a football game, the kickoff team's coming out and they stay in the field, but they go split screen with the commercial. Yeah. And now it's like, it's not totally a commercial, but it's. I always wait forty minutes before I start watching a game, so I can you just zoom it. through yeah, it. Yeah, always. The, that, that way, a game, a one-hour game, lasts an hour. It is crazy. Games are the only time where I actually sit through commercials. I do through the Super Bowl. Yeah, but, yeah. but it's like you're watching an NBA game, and if you're watching live and you want to experience it on Twitter, yeah, but this or is whatever, your business. Yeah, it's you're the only time I really watch Facebook commercials. Facebooking whatever you do, you know, you yeah. young people. Yeah, we've we're starting to figure out ways to actually get content with the, you know you take a sponsor or something they want to do and you actually do something that's fun content with it like we have this gambling podcast with uh my friend sal and he has this make-believe casino captain morgan's make-believe casino because we love captain morgan's and he makes up a bet and then the people on the podcast have to pick which side of the bet Got but it. it's a fake bet because okay. we're in the make-believe casino okay. and it's just really smart like it, it was yeah, yeah. his idea and it works and I just think it's more effective than saying, hey, drink Captain Morgan. It's right. like, not only drink Captain Morgan, but here, we're going to have fun with... This looks like a lot of fun it. to do, too. Oh, this is the best. Yeah. This is... Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, I... I want that job over there. <laughs> the, <laughs> he's got the he's best a conciliary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who was your conciliary at Vanity Fair? Oh, I have Did a have lot one? of them. I have, you know, I'm a firm believer that in, in life... 75% of the time you know what to do, 25% of the time you're not sure. And for that 25%, have a circle of trusted, wise people to talk to, because that 25% is the difference between success and failure. Hmm. So I have like five women in the office who are my, we've worked together for 25 years. One of them, I've worked together with her for 30 years. Wow. Yeah, Amy Bell. And um, uh, she's married to David Camp, the guy who used to write the Walter Monheit. Uh, uh, movie uh, uh, reviews, and so, you know, if I don't know what to do, I'll I'll ask one of them. And um, how do you think? How would they describe you as a boss? Um, I think you know I'm pretty. I mean, I'm a, a fair. I mean, um, I never scream. Collaborative. Very. Yeah. It seems and, like the most successful bosses are the collaborative ones. I'm very appreciative of other people's talents, and and. Um, I remember a friend Dave Zaslow said that Jack Welch, who was like one of the, the great business yeah. leaders of the last century, said that the, one of the things he really appreciated in in an executive was gratitude. And, and I'm very grateful that they've been with me, mostly these from almost from day one, uh, the whole time. And uh, we have, you know, one came over for breakfast this morning. We've, we're just all very close. And, um, and um, that's the thing I'll miss when when I take off. What about you and Kurt? How did that relationship evolve over the years? You know, we were so close. We sat this far apart um, for five years and spent, you know, 10 hours a day together finishing each other's sentences. And then we, we still, friends still see each other. It's just not like sitting five feet away from each other every day, all day long. It's like you were married and then all of a sudden now you're yeah, I mean, just friends. Yeah, I mean, uh, all the spy people are still very close. Uh, we had a reunion in um, uh, November, October, our 30th anniversary. What happened at that? I didn't even know about that. We just did it in the back in the garden of the Waverly. It was like, um, yeah, it was our 30th anniversary. 
I would have crashed that. Yeah, you could have. I just would have pretended. I yeah. would have pretended I was Celia Brady. <laughs> Celia, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, yeah. I was a 15 year old no, kid. Celia Brady was Celia there. Brady. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what happens when you guys all get together for that? There's a lot of, you know, um, uh, well, first of all, we're all older. Everybody's, you know, really gainfully employed, which yeah. is nice. And they're all over. They're all in ma newspapers and magazines. But by the way, that's shows. one of the reasons that magazine was great, because it was all people who, yeah, who went on, you were catching were at the time. right time. Well, there's a woman who writes out here, Nell Scoble. She does a lot of TV writing. Oh, yeah, she's I know Nell. Writer. She wrote for Grantland. She, uh, she's wonderful. And she came out with a line. We did a story on really skin, skinny socialites in New York at the time. And I remember her first sentence was, why it seems so unfair that the woman who is a size two gets to live in a 14 room apartment and the woman's a size 14 gets a two room apartment, which I thought was <laughs> That's a <good> very one. <laughs> clever. Who is your biggest competitor during, um, during, let's say the last 12 years? I mean, a, a, a magazine competitor? Yeah, who did you measure yourself against? Well, you know, we compete against everybody. And for, yeah, but there know, had to be somebody you were kind of monitoring. The New Yorker, um, the New York Times Magazine off and on. Um, Definitely had some off stretches. Even Vogue, because we competed with them for advertising. And um, Rolling Stone on occasion. That but, occasion's passed. No, yeah, but, it, you know, when Jan was... You know, when Jan, Jan is the finest editor of our generation. Yeah. Bar none. I mean, he... Uh, he discovered more talent. He was a, when he was in the office, that magazine was tops. I agree. And, but you know, it's a, by the same token, he wanted to live a life as well. Um, yeah, no, nobody, Rolling Stone was a remarkable, remarkable achievement. We've serialized his, uh, this book on Rolling Stone that Joe Hagen's written in our next issue. I heard he's pissed off about it. He is. He, gay, he kind of turned his life over to the guy, and then the guy yes. wrote a I mean, kind of a flattering and unflattering thing about yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't notice anything that's um, um, inaccurate about the book, but it, and I'll tell you, he was having a hell of a lot more fun than we were at Time Magazine in the <laughs> 1970s. <laughs> but, you know, button down shirts. And yeah. Then, yeah, that was quite a time to be in Mag the 70s. Oh, my God, the 90s, too. I mean, the last three days, I found a photograph of my children. I can't even believe this. My, my older kids. I found a photograph of my kids on the on the Concord. That was Connie Nass back in the 90s. You had the Oscar party was the great trump card for you guys. That was a good thing. You yeah. guys had this. when it, would, They must have had it even before you took the job. But no, no. It was, oh, they uh, didn't? Okay. No. It, Swifty Lazara had a, a, an Oscar party up at the old Spago. And then I went to the last year he did it. And then Swifty died. And I thought it'd be a good thing for the magazine if Fanny Fair did it. So I, the, the then power restaurant in Los Angeles at the time was Morton's. <clears throat> so I called up Peter Morton and said, I'd love to do it. He said, well, the Trump's one of my best friends is Steve Tisch. He's already called me. So for the first, so Steve and I did it together for a couple of years. And then he stopped doing it and we've done it ever since. And that really, what do you think was the key year that it really became... You know, that there was blossomed. a year when Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman, it might have been the Jerry Maguire year or something. It just, it grew uh, organically. We started off very small, 150, 200 people. And I'm a firm believer in, in not making, not, not over-promising something and making it uh, small, let it grow in a, in a arithmetic way rather than an exponential way. And yeah. so now we, we had trouble, you know, trying to keep the numbers down. Is that, I mean, I know, I know for people have said this about Lauren Michaels too, that the toughest, one of the toughest things about walking away from a job like that, other than the action and being around talented people all the time is just, just kind of being the gatekeeper for some of this stuff. It like is, Lauren Michaels is like the man he is and the, the man, moment yeah. he's not doing that show, maybe it flips a little bit. I'm sure you've thought about that oh, too yeah. with Vanity Fair, right? You know, the, the funny thing is the night of the Oscars, I would just, I love planning for something. I think it's really I love marshalling all the troops and all the design and everything like that. The night of the Oscars rolls around, I just I would kill to be in bed eating Chinese food, screaming <laughs> well, at the TV. Yeah, yeah, it starts late, goes late. It's a long day at the office for yeah. me. Yeah, and I, you know, I'm not a comfortable um, social gad about. I mean, I'm I like people, but I'm not a, I'm not comfortable in crowds. I actually, you know, I'm very claustrophobic. I have great. Um, 
uh, social anxiety, so I'd have to take a beta blocker before I, the thing started. And I'd want to like make sure I, I stayed awake through the most important parts of the evening. So I you know I'd, I usually leave around midnight. It seems like that Vanity Fair Summit thing is your ideal it's two day I, hang because like of the than, ideas and the oh, people. I love all yeah. that. And it, 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 I love it more than I thought I would. Yeah. I could tell when the year I did it, you yeah. just seemed like you were like a pig in shit with the whole thing. Not you a pig in shit. But no, I, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean in, yeah. a ha in a happy way. You just yeah, loved it. I, yeah, uh, or at least I showed it was looking like I loved it. I, would, I felt like you loved yeah, it. Yeah, no, I did actually. I felt like you were yeah, like, this is yeah. great. You're mm -hmm. here. He's there. This yeah. is coming. Really interesting people. Yeah. What is life if not people? Yeah, I'm glad you moved to Tele. I'm, yeah. in, I'm in next year. We'll come up with some yeah, sort of sports yeah. something. Yeah. We did. It was me and the year I did it was me and Macro did the future it, of sports it media. It was great. We were throwing bombs. Yeah, no, it was really terrific. And the two of you guys sitting there with like man spreading and yeah. <laughs> yeah, we were. It was like two people who don't really give a shit in those yeah. situations, which is what you want from a yeah. panel. You want people Absolutely. to kind of throw it around a little bit. Yeah, John's pretty. You're, you're both pretty out there in Say a good stuff. way. How long have you owned that famous restaurant in New York that nobody can get into? The Waverly, and we we opened it in two thousand and. Four, I think, maybe two thousand and three. So it's about fourteen years old. It's still, still hard. It's been to get around into. forever, though. I mean, it's yeah. been there for a hundred years. Yeah, you bought it. And yeah, yeah, over. yeah. And I live two doors down, so I can technically go home to pee when, in the, rather than use the bathroom. There. <laughs> Do you feel like this whole era of exclusivity with, you know, like the Soho House, all these different places, it's hard to get in. Um, that that's that's kind of going up a couple levels as we get, all get older here. Um, I do think that um, unavailability is sort of uh, one's whether you're a company or a person greatest asset. asset. Yeah. And um, sports teams are starting to figure this out a little like, bit by doing what? Like the little courtside clubs where at oh, halftime, yes, 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 only so many people can go underneath. Yeah, it's and, like a Jerry yeah. Jones thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, there's always it's I, I used to have this sort of sort of philosophy about New York that it's a it's a house of seven rooms. And every time you figure a oh, funny I've arrived, I've gotten in this room, you know, there's a door at the other end. Yeah, and you open that? that and there's an even better room. Yeah. And so I think life is a bit like that, that there's always you're really happy. But there's that what's that door in the corner doing there? Mm. Let me open and see what that looks like. And the people are better looking and the food is better and the, and so that um, yeah, life's a, six, a series of rooms, and people are, are monetizing that as to what you young people say. I would agree. Um, best writer you ever edited? Um, hmm. I mean, this is, I'm going to ask you like four difficult questions in a row, right? Christopher now. Hitchens was the most um, uh, fluid writer I've ever met. I mean, we'd go out for lunch, and and when uh, this is at the Observer. And, and Amy Bell and Christopher and I would go out to lunch and we would, uh, he would drink they could, I mean, two thirds of a bottle of wine and a couple of um, after dinner drinks. And we'd come back, we'd sit him down in front of a typewriter and he'd type out a thousand words in 35 minutes. And you didn't have to do much. Charlie Pierce was like that Charlie when Pierce he wrote was, for Grantland. I bet he's still like that. Now. Oh, I guarantee you. Yeah. He'd be like, Charlie, the hour later is like yeah, 1,300 yeah. words. Yeah, yeah, like short order cooks. Yeah. Yeah. But that, I mean, that, those are people that they're another uh, yeah. species. I mean, James Walcott writes for me. I think is a brilliant writer. I mean, he just he he, he um, you know he currents every single word and chooses whether that's the right one. And I think it takes him a good part of four or five days to write a thousand words. Who is the best writer you pursued heavily but could not pull off? Um, other than me. Other than you, I worked very hard to try to get you. Yeah, um, uh, you're doing this HBO show, and we're like really busy. I know, yeah, yeah but not, not busy anymore. <laughs> yeah, with it. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah, that um, level of business. Yeah. Now you're last. available. I don't have a magazine available. anymore. Yeah, yeah. yeah, look, we missed our moment. <laughs> um, a, a writer who I, um, I used to speak to, sometimes three hours a day. Um, for years and years with Michael Hare, but he had he had written dispatches. He was one of the great journalists of all time, and he and he was he was he became a Buddhist after uh, Vietnam. He used to write all Kubrick's movies as well, and he wrote uh, like the he wrote the 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 
the narration for Apocalypse Now. He was brought in to fix the things. And Michael was a wonderful, peaceful person. I only got over 10 years of like constant talking. I only got two pieces out of him. I would have liked more, but wow. he, he said, I'm done writing. Did you ever make a run at ta Coates? No, but I wish I'd had. Yeah, that was, yeah. that seems like somebody who would have been yep. an incredible yep. idiot because he comes in He's got it. Yeah. seven, eight, nine times a year. Yep. He parachutes in with the best take yep. on whatever's going on. I agree. He's brilliant. Yeah. Um, so what's next for you? You figured it out yet? No, I have a lot of ideas. I say we're taking off to France for six months. I love that part of the world and the simplicity. And uh, yeah, I have a rough idea. I know who I'm going to do it with, I, roughly. And um, it'll be, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You just have to make a, a really interesting wheel that doesn't exist now. You know, I've learned failure. I always tell my kids that, you know, a failure is, uh, you rarely learn from success. You only learn from failures. And I had, I had a magazine in Canada when I was in college and it was basically it was a literary political magazine, ran it for five years, and it just folded. And then I had Spy, which I ran for five years, it was really successful. And the difference was Spy had a point to it, whereas the magazine in Canada didn't. Yeah. We opened the Waverly Inn in the West Village, and at that point there were no American restaurants in the West Village. We had red banquettes and white tablecloths, and that was they just didn't exist in the West Village at that time. Then we opened another restaurant, very similar to it, banquettes, Leather banquettes, white tablecloth, same kind of food, American comfort food, two blocks away, and it didn't work because it didn't have a point. The Waverly Inn had a point. The other one was just there because we had a great space. So whatever I do, it's it's just gonna have to have a point. I actually think that sounds really, simplistic, but it's, no. But you know what? It's 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 a great point. Yeah, and I think it's lost on a lot of people, and I know. At Grantland, I knew exactly what I wanted it to be. Yeah, yeah. And we had a point. Yep. And with The Ringer, we we spent a lot of time in a house that we rented a few blocks away from here trying to figure out what is the point of this website. Other than a continuation of... We didn't want it to be a continuation, yeah. you know? And we, and we wanted to react better to how the internet moved. But at some point, you have to have a point. And I think it took us about nine, ten months to realize, like, the point of this, other than trying to be a multimedia or whatever, is you really have to double down on the three, four, five things you're great yes. at and go all in on yes. those things, and yeah. then everything else will fall into place. What you could take what we the did. Grantland name? They're, are they still using it? No, and we, you know, it's the a Grant, good name. It was a good one, and I, I think, uh, you know, how it was playing out with Grantland was so good in so many ways, and yet they just didn't know what to do with it. So. Yeah, it just was the wrong place. I think if we had been almost anywhere else, I think it would have. Yeah, it's a great you know, name. We hit this point. It's funny. I hated the name. That was John Skipper. It was a good. He name. was right. Yeah, because we had it was the placeholder for the website. Oh, that's interesting. We had this old uh, this old legend Walter Bernard that I designed Walter, the first yeah. website, which we quickly changed. But he put Grantland in as the placeholder for because we didn't have the name. Yeah, and then there's this point where Skipper said. You know that great land name's growing on me, yeah. and I'm like, oh no, come on, that's terrible. And and he's like, well, top it, come up with a better name, and I couldn't. Yeah. And then it turned out to be a great name. Great I, name. I'm actually glad we. Skipper used to hang around Spy Magazine all the time in the 80s. Oh yeah, he yeah, loved. He was it. very I, good friends with Tom Phillips. Well, he's see. a Rolling Stone guy too. Really? Yeah, Skipper worked oh, for yeah, Rolling Stone. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think all the right people seem like they hung around Spy. Yeah, some. Yeah. Yeah. 35th anniversary? Maybe that I get the, the invite? No, that was the 35th. No, yes. 35th, yeah, 35th. Maybe I'd sneak in as yeah, like a busboy. Like 2000 <laughs> and some, you know, 30 years. No, we're, it's only three years off. You know, I had the first five years in my garage. Are you serious? Yeah. Those are the best years, too. Um, Those are the funny years. I had some, my mom, because she's, to be generous, um, maybe didn't realize to not be generous. Maybe it was being spiteful and didn't like having the magazines in the house. But she threw out the ones I had saved. So I was kind of circling eBay for like three years. Oh, yeah. And then some jackass just put up the whole collection. Really? Like the first five years for like 180 bucks or something. Wow. I, just, wow. I took it down like in a millisecond. Yeah. And this giant thing comes, this giant box with all these spy right. magazines. And my wife was like, what the fuck? Yeah. What are you going to do with these? And yeah. I was like, you don't understand. Jason Abrams important. has a complete set. Yeah, they're yeah. out there. They're yeah. now they're more expensive. Yeah, we have it now. It's funny. We did these Grantland quarterlies that 
um, we took a lot of shit for like everything else the first year. And I really wanted to do them because, you know, I felt like we'd have enough every three months for a book that I'd want to put in my bookshelf yeah. 10 years from now I'd want to read. So we did 12 and the last four are really hard to get, but just in general, the set's hard to get. And now the set goes for like $800. Oh, and I was like, this is, this is cool. This is exactly why we did this. And you know, I don't know how many are out there, but I'm it's very cool. big on making sure that if you've done something like that, keeping a box aside, cause you'd be surprised how quickly they disappear. Oh yeah. I mean, I'm sure if you had done, a spy quarterly every we six a, months we or did something. a bunch of books one of you the did a books couple we, books yeah we did one of the books we did spy high which treated like um american celebrity as a high school I mean, yeah Trump i remember that on one. The, the you cover. act like i don't have all these books. okay well th i have one copy left i mean it's funny that, really yeah yes yeah and well, i remember separated the separated at birth book was a thing yeah that was it was a that was huge like huge seller letterman did I'm going to say he did top 10 lists as a book. He did some sort of book in yeah. that book and your yeah, book. Yeah. Both of them, like everybody yeah, had those actually books. Yeah, we did two separated birth yeah. books, but yeah. He and might have to bring that back. Uh, you yeah. don't own Spy anymore though, right? No, it's owned by a man called Joe Coleman, who's the the Coleman mustard heir. You know, oh, let's Coleman tie him mustard? up and torture him. We'll get yeah, it back. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm you too just old. Just take him somewhere for a weekend. Yeah, no, we'll hire you, some thugs. you got to be young and angry and 35. So he's just holding Spy and not doing anything yeah, with it? Yeah, yeah. He bought it from Pagazzi and Saatchi. It's like ESPN just has Grant Lennon. Yeah. And just, well, it was this brand that actually probably was worth something at some point, And now it's give just it to you now. dead. Yeah. I doubt it. I think they would give me VD before they give no. me <laughs> Grant Lennon. <laughs> You let us say that on a podcast. No, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Maybe who knows? Yeah. Things things thaw over time. Yeah, as yeah. you found as you yeah. found out, you took over Vanity Fair, everyone's mad at you. And yeah. then within three years, everyone wants to come to your Oscar party. Yeah, then they came around. Yeah. It took it took a while. How is how was it? We're done. How was your first podcast? Did you like I it? I loved it. This it's is, good, right? It is a collector's idea. You wanna have one? I'm gonna do this. If for you a wanna have a podcast, we'll have your podcast. <laughs> I'm I'm dead. Tommy, am I serious? <laughs> He'll book it for you. Yeah, okay, you can have yeah, guests. If yeah. you want to do one, tell me. Are you the booker? Okay. He's yeah. more than a booker. I don't think you need me. Yeah. He's, he's, yeah. he's one of the hottest talent relations people, people in the country. Do people even listen to this? You, I would say hundreds of thousands of people listen to this. Are you this. serious? Yeah. Wow. What's going to happen is over the next couple of weeks, people are going to constantly say to you, you on the I heard you on yeah, that Simmons yeah. podcast. Hey, yeah. it was great. Yeah. And you're going to be like, oh my God, I should have done 20 podcasts. Yeah, they say, you sound like such an ass, Graydon. <laughs> <laughs> Simmons is smart. No, they're going like, to say, I heard you had the Simmons. Then they're going to say, you had a Saab convertible? Yeah. I love that car. I might have had one too. I it was always in the shop. Uh, mine was. Mine I bought was. a used one and it was a disaster. Okay, no, yeah, I'd back when I had no money either. It was either, the so last it was even worse. sports car you could buy in America with five speed transmission. Yeah. 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 Now it's yeah. impossible. Yeah. All right. Great and Carter, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Bill. This was fun. Okay, guys. Thanks. Hey, thanks so much to Hotel Tonight, the app that helps you find amazing hotel deals at the last minute up to seven days in advance, perfect for a spontaneous getaway or indulging in a little staycation. Booking on Hotel Tonight gives you the freedom and flexibility to play things by ear while knowing you'll score a great price and a great, great place to stay. Get in on these killer last minute deals. Download the Hotel Tonight app now. I think we're up to like eight ringer staffers who have used the Hotel Tonight app. So check it out. Thanks to stamps.com, buy and print official US postage for any letter, any package, any class of mail. Use your own computer and printer. They'll send you a digital scale, automatically calculate exact postage. You will never have to go to the post.